everyone, it's Paige and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I haven't done a sit down video in a minute, so I thought it'd be fun to mix it up a little bit. So as you guys know, I played competitive golf and there were a lot that I wish I did differently. So that's what this video is going to be about. Uh, what I wish I did differently when I was a competitive golfer and hopefully this will help all the parents out there with aspiring golfers. We're going to talk through junior golf into college and then when I was playing professionally. So you know what, let's just get right on into it. First off, let's talk about my competitive playing credentials because I do think that's important to this video because most people actually don't know this. Played junior golf, college golf, and a year professionally. In junior golf, I was ranked number one in the state of Colorado. I was a top five recruit in my graduation class, which was 2011, and I was top 25 in the world as a junior golfer. I ended up getting a scholarship to play golf at University of Arizona. Wasn't the right fit, which we will get into a little later on in the video. So I transferred and had a full ride scholarship to play golf at San Diego State University, where I was first and second all conference and I was also on the Dean's List. And I was also on the Student Advisory Committee. I was team captain my junior and senior year, and at San Diego State ended up winning our conference championship. It was the first time in school history for uh, the women's golf team, which was really exciting. We also had three individual golfers qualify into regionals, which I think has been done before, but um, not for San Diego State, which was a cool accomplishment for our team. We ended up also going to regionals as a team, which again was really cool. Never qualified for nationals, but after college, I ended up going and playing golf professionally. There, it's a grind, but we'll talk about this in a little bit as well. Um, I played around 25 events the first year as a professional, made money in all of them but two, and had a pro win on the Cactus Tour, which is a mini tour, but it still counts as a pro win. And I also made the cut at the Scottish Open, which is a European tour event, an LET event. So that's what I accomplished. <laughs> also have a couple course records and needless to say, there is this misconception that I don't know what I'm talking about, but I have played golf at a very high level. I am proud of all of my accomplishments. No, I did not make it on to the LPGA Tour. I'm not one of the best golfers in the world, um, but I am still very proud of everything that I have accomplished and how hard I worked to uh, get there. So I'm excited to share all of my experiences and what I wish I did differently to potentially have helped me make it onto the LPGA Tour because it was years of just scar tissue that I was building from mistakes that I made. So yeah, let's talk about the maybe not so good stuff now. <laughs> Number one, the first thing that I wish I did differently was not care about rankings so much in junior golf especially. So the junior golf scene is highly intense and competitive. It's actually quite scary. <laughs> the parents are insane, insane. And you feel pressured to be the best in your state and the best in the country. And you always want all these accolades and to be number one, you know, and, and obviously that's when you play professionally, that's what you're going after as well. But to have that much pressure on you at such a young age and continue that on from junior golf to college to professionally, it burns out so many kids. And I've seen this firsthand where you have a highly ranked junior golfer completely burn out by the time they get to college because they are so focused in and it feels like a job. You feel like you're already on tour when you are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And that's even before you get to college, which is even more of a grind and it's exhausting. And so I would say focus more on your development as a player and less on the rankings. Yes, it's important to get a full ride scholarship for some people, that was really important to me, but you can still do that and you don't have to be number one and you don't have to do all of these things because guess how many people know my junior golf ranking and bring it up this, today? <laughs> Zero, zero. Um, 
no one talks about it. And so I worked so hard and I was obsessed with the rankings and no one remembers and no one cares. And so if that's something that motivates you, fine, you can look at it. If that motivates your, your child, fine, look at it. It did not motivate me. It made me obsessive and put a lot of pressure on me. And that was number one. Don't care or look at the rankings because in junior golf, it does not matter. Number two, stop seeking a perfect swing and start playing. I, and I think this is because of my gymnastics background and my mom was a professional ballet dancer and her background and we were just raised to be perfect. And you were always seeking perfection. And in golf, we know this, you can't do that because it doesn't matter if you have the perfect swing. If you don't have the mindset of going low and knowing how to score, it's all for nothing. And so I would spend hours, hours every single day on the driving range. People would call me a range rat. I would hit these, they were like, <laughs> I was at McCormick Ranch and they had these jumbo buckets and I would hit four of them trying to get the perfect swing. And my mom would stand there and she would watch to make sure I hit all the correct positions. And it's great because now I have a very pretty swing, but when all you're doing is hitting golf ball after golf ball and trying to get this perfect swing, it's really hard to take that swing onto the golf course. I wish that I learned to play the game and just swung my own swing. I was trying to, I've always had a very athletic swing and kind of a lot of movement through my swing. And so I always tried to restrict my movement, which made me less athletic. And I wasn't using my body and my athleticism to my advantage because I was trying to hit these perfect positions that just wasn't for me. I wish instead I was trying to hit the ball as hard as I possibly could. And then from there I can control it as I get older and practice my short game and putting and learning how to score. Another thing is adding in pressure and learning how to compete. When there was pressure on me, I crumbled because I was just so focused on trying to have the perfect swing. And that was my mindset instead of let's figure this out and let's try to uh, beat the golf course or beat the person that I was playing. And so whenever I had that type of pressure on me, I couldn't handle it. So conditioning your kid at a young age to see competition as fun and something that they look forward to and not something that they're scared of because they are scared of not being perfect and failing. And so it's just changing their mindset around it. And I wish that I did that differently. And maybe it's also just a personality flaw that I have that I was always just <laughs> born to be this way and I would always just struggle under pressure but I think that there were things that I could have done when I was younger to help me get out of that mindset and to see competition as fun instead of seeing it as a place where I would fail. Number three, understanding that in golf you are going to have a lot of failure. With my gymnastics background, and I come from a very sports-centric family, but not a golf family. And so I was always taught that if you work hard, dedicate yourself, you will be successful. That's not always the case with golf. You can work your butt off every single day, which I did. Anyone who has watched me practice knows that I have an incredible work ethic. I always have. And I would spend so many hours practicing this stupid, stupid game, <laughs> like hours on hours on hours. I'd be there from morning till night. And you know how frustrating it is when you are practicing so hard and dedicating everything to the point where I was homeschooled. I didn't even have a social life. I didn't even do anything else. All I did was focus in on golf. And then you dedicate everything you have and then you show up and you don't play well. And Everything that you've been told in life is if you work hard and you do all these things that you're going to be successful and you're going to lower your scores and you're going to do all this and then it doesn't happen. That's really frustrating and it makes you not want to work hard. And so I think the mindset around golf is that when your kid is playing in all of these junior golf tournaments is to ride out the lows because there are going to be so many lows in golf and you're going to have more bad rounds than good rounds, especially when you're developing as a player and learning what works best for you is 
not being so hard on your kids and not being so hard on yourself. I was so hard on myself when I would have these bad rounds because I just couldn't understand how this the hard work that I was putting in on the range and in the gym and into my mental game was not translating over into um, lower scores or more wins. And I just, it really ate me alive because I didn't understand how golf worked and how it's not a game of perfection. And sometimes no matter how hard you work, it just isn't there because it's all, all up here. <laughs> and knowing that the hard work will pay off. It might not be today, it might not be a month from now, but if you keep consistently showing up every single day, it will come and having a really great support system around you to ride out those lows because I have seen so many players as well burn out because of how mentally exhausting golf is. It is so different than any other sport and you really need a good team around you to lift you up because sometimes you could be doing all the right things and everything's great but it's just not clicking and that is okay. So having that understanding that it is okay to shoot those bad scores and just to keep it up because it will turn around and you will get there eventually you just gotta write up lows number four is it doesn't actually matter what college you go to you have to find a place that fits your game and your personality best i have seen so many players go to a top ranked university and think that they're going to thrive and there ends up being a clash within the team, maybe the personalities don't quite mesh, or coaching style is different than uh, their coach from home, and so they end up just not doing well in college. And they don't want to play professionally after that because college is such a bad experience. So we see a lot of transfers, we see a lot of kids just end up quitting when they get to college. And there is the pressure on you to go to a D1 school, get that full ride scholarship and have them be, you know, nationally ranked. But I don't think that's as important as finding a college coach that really understands you, can develop your game if you want to continue playing on professionally and finding a team that really meshes with you and your personality. And if you don't have aspirations of playing golf after, then go to a really great school and use golf as a way to get a full ride scholarship and to do what you want to do after college and have golf be the vessel that carries you there. And so you have to think about all these things, which is hard when you are pressured into making this decision, a massive decision when you, one, are so young and two, you have to make it so quickly. I remember that I mean, people are signing <laughs> their national letter of intents really early on. And it's just this kind of culture within probably all sports, but I can only speak to golf where you want to be the first one to sign. You want to be to a good school. And once they have their spots um, allotted for, then you can't go to that school anymore. So there is a lot of pressure to like make this decision really early on. And I didn't take enough visits. I only took two visits and I wish I did so many more. Again, I just felt this pressure to commit early on. I thought I knew what I wanted. It wasn't actually what I wanted. And so I ended up making my college experience much harder because I did have to transfer because the first school that I was at was not the right fit for me. And it has been the right fit for so many people. So many people have a great experience there, but for me, it wasn't the right fit. And so I ended up transferring to San Diego State, which was the right fit for me. And it's where I needed to be, but I just didn't even, that wasn't even a school that was on my radar when I was going through the process. It's very intimidating when, you know, day one, you get all of these letters, you have to um, sort through it all. I think I got offers from almost every school except for two, I believe. And um, the I didn't wanna to go to those two schools anyways, but um, you have this stack, like it's a full stack of letters and emails and coaches contacting you. And it is so overwhelming. And I wish that I just took a step back, took a deep breath, realize that I can take as many visits as I want and I should take as many visits as I want because you're spending um, four or five years at this place 
um, where you are doing your most growth as a person and you're away from your parents for the first time and it's very overwhelming and a tough experience for a lot of people, especially for me because I was homeschooled from fourth grade until college. And so I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be close to home and I just, um, I think I was so nervous and so overwhelmed. I keep saying that word, but, um, by the whole experience and me being away from home because I'm very close to my parents that I just kind of rushed it. And my parents and I talk about this all the time, that we wish we slowed down, we wish we took more visits and we wish we put more thought into it instead of just trying to um, sign and kind of almost get it over with. So um, take your time, go through the process. And sometimes a good D2 school is better than a D1 if that fits you and your wants and your needs much more. At the end of the day, whatever gets you to your final goal, it doesn't matter how you do it. And again, I think there is this pressure that you have to be highly ranked in junior golf and you have to get a full ride scholarship to a top D1 university. And then from there, then you'll play professionally. And it's like, sometimes that doesn't work for you and that's okay. Sometimes there's a different route that leads you into playing golf professionally if that's what you wanna do, instead of burning you out trying to do something that you think you should be doing. And so listen to your gut, listen to you know the people close to you and take your time through the process. And I wish I did that. Number five, being more prepared coming out of college. So I, this might just only apply to me personally because I was at a really weird point in my life, but I do feel that a lot of student athletes aren't quite prepared when they have to make a switch from college athletics into uh, playing a sport professionally and what that looks like. Because when you're in college, everything is provided for you. So we had tees and golf balls and shoes and apparel and our bag and all of these things and head covers. And then in junior golf, your parents are paying for everything and so you don't actually really understand the process and how expensive everything is and then they just throw you out in the real world and I think it's a little bit better now because of the NLI program and you can earn money when you are in college but when back in my day <laughs> when I was in school that wasn't a thing and so I had no connections no money and just this dream of playing golf professionally. And so I had to get like a second job to be able to pay for my golf career. And so I was caddying, I was doing uh, junior golf clinics, I was help running junior tournaments, anything I could to get a little extra cash to pay for my golf career because it is extremely, extremely expensive. And so there's a couple ways you can go about this. One, you hope that you have parents that can help you out <laughs> in the you know beginning stages. But if you don't, like a lot of people um, don't have that financial security, you have to get a second job, which means that you can't spend as much time practicing, which is tough because now all you wanna do is practice and play to make money, but you can't do that because you don't have money. And so it's this vicious circle or you end up meeting um, like a donor, someone to be able to invest into your career. The problem with that is if you don't make it and you don't make enough money, then you have to owe this person a lot of money that they have invested into you, which is really stressful. And so I always recommend don't go that route um, because I still have friends who have decided to not play golf professionally anymore and they still have to pay their investors back. And uh, it's an extra layer of stress. So that's tough. And so I actually was, that's how I got into doing media work is that I didn't have any money for golf. And so these golf companies after I blew up online were, were like, hey, we'll give you some golf balls. And I'm like, I need golf balls. <laughs> I need shoes, I need tees, I need a place to practice. Like I have nothing. And the tournament fees are really expensive. And it was a lot and you're not fully prepared for that. And within college, you meet a lot of really great people who can help you along the way. And I don't think that is stressed upon, you know, young college kids enough that when you go to these, you know, donor events, network, like that's really, really important. And that just isn't something that is told to us and what it's like after and how to do these things and how to be an adult. So when I was on the student advisory committee, I kept telling the university, I was like, we need to have some type of program to help these student athletes because we just, 
weren't able to do internships and we weren't able to do a lot of these things. And even when we were in high school, we didn't have time to get us a, a job or um, we're just like babies and we need to be taught how to do these things because we just have lived very different lives. And then just to have your sport be your whole focus for your entire life. And if you, even if you don't go professionally, all of a sudden you're thrown out there and you have no connections, you haven't done the internships and you've never had a job before. And now you're just expected to know what to do. That's very stressful. And on the flip side, then you're supposed to play your sport professionally, yet you, you have no support and you have no money. How do you handle that? And so I just never feel like student athletes are set up for success after college. And now I think it has changed, like I said, but still there are those pitfalls and there's these worries that I'm sure all of these kids are having. And that's why you see these things happen with student athletes where they're, once they quit or when they're going through it, there's just a lot of depression and anxiety because of all the pressure that we've had and then you, you're not prepared and it's, it's a lot. So I wish I was more prepared and I wish that I knew what life after college athletics was going to be like. And I wish that um, universities would prepare students a little bit better, student athletes, for what that looks like. Six, I wish that <laughs> I didn't spend so much time on sports psychologists, but hear me out. So I was a head case on the golf course, head case, absolute basket case. Um, I think I would have made it if I wasn't so cuckoo up there when it came to competing. And we tried every single sports psychologist under the sun. <laughs> from biofeedback to like these weird like tapping techniques to um hit, I was hypnotized I have seen everyone had tried everything and nothing was working for me so later on in my life I sought out therapy because I just felt like I needed it I was going through a lot of changes and I've always just had pretty bad anxiety like crippling anxiety and so once I started going through therapy and learning myself and finding inner happiness, lo and behold, my golf game gets better for the first time ever in my entire life. This is after I stopped playing golf competitively, but even after I stopped playing, I had a very weird and complicated relationship with like keeping score and competitive golf and even playing with other people and we were keeping score i hated it couldn't do it and then once i started this journey of self-discovery and becoming you know more self-aware and more in tune with my emotions and my um past trauma in my life and all of these things that i never really dealt with because i only saw sports psychologist my game got better and so I recommend therapy first, then sports psychology, because I think I would have been more receptive in understanding of the sports psychology if I did therapy first, because these demons that we're facing and these feelings that we have, they come from our childhood or we come from these things that have happened in our lives and it bleeds into everything that we're doing. And for me, that was competitive golf. You got to fix the leak first and not just put a Band-Aid over it. And that's what sports psychology felt like to me, that we weren't really tackling the icky, not fun stuff to talk about. We were just trying to be like, why <laughs> Why do you feel this way on the golf course? And I'm like, well, I don't know, you know? And they're like, well, just try to think of positive things and visualize. And that that doesn't work when there's parts of you that aren't fully healed. And you need to do that work first before you can do the sports psychology to get you to that next level. Personally, that's for me personally. I know everyone's different. This is a very personalized journey that you have to go on to what makes you happiest. But that is what I personally wish that I did different. Is that I saw a therapist first and then a sports psychologist. Number seven, I wish I knew how, <laughs> how sucky life on tour was going to be. Um, no one tells you how much of a drain emotionally, physically, financially, trying to be a competitive golfer is. And it's incredibly difficult. You are constantly on the road, you have no money, and you are playing week in and week out, and sometimes for the girls in not great places, 
and it's very lonely because we're all feeling this way so we're not our happiest and we all have this um competitive towards one another because we want to get to that next level and so it just breeds this environment of uh, animosity and it's not healthy and it's not fun and it's truly a grind it's especially difficult for women through all of the stages because you really aren't making any money until you get to like the top 20 in the world at what you do, at least for the guys that their purses are much bigger. And so you can still survive as a mini tour player, but as a mini tour player for the women, you are making pennies. Like for example, when I played, um, I only missed the cut in two tournaments and I had to win and I had a, a pretty decent year for my, you know, rookie year and I barely broke even, barely broke even. And so that's why I was doing this media work to be able to even pay for my golf career because it is so incredibly expensive Q school and it keeps going up every single year, but it's at least $10,000 for like one or two of the stages. And so you were in all of this money and you have the pressure to play well. You don't know what you're doing. You're doing this for the first time. And if you miss the cut, you make nothing. You make nothing. And it's not fun. <laughs> Truly, it's not fun. When golf becomes a job, and I think people who play golf for fun, it's hard to wrap their head around this because they're like, oh my God, I would, I'd love to play golf for fun every single day. And um and then when it becomes a job, it's not much fun. That's like everything, you know, jobs cannot be fun. But again, there's just this mental, mental grind with golf that just makes you exhausted, exhausted. You hate playing, you hate practicing, you feel all this pressure and it really breaks people down a lot. I've talked to so many players who have such a complicated relationship with the game now once they have quit because of all of the scar tissue that they endured through um, the ups and the downs and especially all of the downs. It, it really truly tears you apart and makes you hate the game. And I wish I knew that. <laughs> I wish I knew how much of a grind it was. I wish I knew that you don't have any help. I wish I knew that it was lonely. And I wish I knew that it drains your bank account. And I wish that <laughs> I knew that you, you know, you, you played dog tracks. Like what you see the guys on the PGA Tour. And that's why this conversation about money and live versus PGA Tour is so exhausting because I've seen it on the other side where we're making nothing and we truly are playing for the love of the game. And so for these players to be complaining and, you know, bitching about $100 million is enough. And it's like, I could barely eat some weeks. I know girls that were working three, four jobs to be able to like help pay for their golf careers. And they're like living in their cars and living with host families and doing all this stuff and sacrificing so much. And people don't really see that side of it. People think that golf is you're playing as amazing country clubs and you're making, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and it, it's just not the case, especially for the women. And people deal with a lot of emotional abuse just playing this stupid, stupid game. And I wish I knew that because I think that, let's say that mentally I wasn't a basket case. I have, I've always physically had the skills to make it, but I don't think I would like the lifestyle. And... There are so many factors on why you make it or not make it. And I just don't think it's talked about enough. And I know we always, and I don't have kids, so I don't know this. And I know you always want to encourage your kids to dream big and do all this stuff. But man, I wish I knew more about what, <laughs> what life on tour truly looked like. Because you have to be a very special person to be able to endure that, to make it on tour and to do all these things. Because it's, it's truly such a grind and something like I've never experienced before. And that's it. You know, a nice little fun, happy video for you guys. <laughs> now, all jokes aside, I do think this is really important to discuss. And I love sharing my experience, the good and the bad. And hopefully you guys can learn from the mistakes that I've made and things that I wish I knew. And that this helps you, um, hopefully, and your aspiring uh, little pro golfer. If you want a part two on this, because there's so much more that I could dive into a little bit deeper, comment down below. But to wrap it up, it's a long road ahead and golf is, as we all know, emotionally uh, exhausting. And so to make the road a little bit easier, make competition fun in junior golf and in college, 
uh, don't put too much pressure on them. And uh, most of the time, if they have these aspirations to play golf professionally, they're already putting enough pressure on themselves. And that's what I did. I was my own worst enemy and I wanted to get there so, so badly. It was everything that I wanted. Um, my only dream that I had was to play golf on the LPGA Tour. And I put so much pressure on myself from the start of it. And I had great supporting parents, but um, you know, when you don't come from a golf family, you don't know these kind of ins and outs, it's, it's really difficult. And we talk about this all the time together that we're like, oh, I wish I did this differently or I wish I did this and maybe I would be there. Or maybe I was just born to do what I'm doing now. And everyone always finds their way into what they should be doing. But making the path exciting for them and um, allowing them the grace to develop at their own timeline as well like you don't have to be great when you're younger honestly i wish that i didn't feel like i peaked in junior golf i wish that i was developing and trying new things in junior golf and in college golf and then by the time i got to pro that's when i really blossomed but when you have this pressure on you to peak in, in junior golf and play well in college golf and then to play well in professional golf it's you know really difficult so hopefully this video was helpful uh leave a comment down below don't forget to like and subscribe we are closing in on 400,000 subscribers woo, which is super exciting um i want to get to 500 that's kind of been a goal of mine for a while so tell your neighbors tell your friends tell your family tell everyone to subscribe to my channel and uh, share this video around if you know um, anyone who has kids who are trying to play golf professionally because I've been through it and I didn't end up making it. So, you know, I have a lot of experience to share. <laughs> and that's all. Okay, bye. See you guys next Thursday. Bye. Hey guys, I know that you are loving my YouTube channel, but you haven't seen the best stuff yet. That's over on my subscription site only page, link down below for three free videos. Definitely go check it out right now.